forecasting our future. We could see four to 10 more degrees by the end of the century. Weather impacts our lives. We sometimes don't notice the effects of heat on our bodies. Fighting Florida's blazing sun. Why do you need to do this? The balance of the ecosystem at a boiling point. What can I do to protect myself and my family? The global, national, and local fight to save the Earth. We are all impacted by this climate. They're a great indication of if something is wrong in the environment. Scientists forging a new path. You guys are making an effort to make this grass that you're growing inside. People planting seeds of growth. A reduction of five to 10 degrees of being underneath a tree is a big deal. They say the best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago. Next best time is today. The WPPF 25 First Warning Weather Team investigates the link between our climate. This is not normal anymore. And the changing environment. Welcome everybody to the Cox Science Center and Aquarium here in West Palm Beach. I'm Mike Lyons, very excited to host tonight's program that we call Forecasting Our Future the first in a series of groundbreaking programs that will examine our changing climate. Join me as we dive deep into science inside the Earth Matters Rethink the Future interactive exhibit. In nature, everything is connected, the air, the land, and the water. You can have a big impact on the world around you. In the next half hour, we're gonna walk you through this eye-opening exhibit. But first, we start with our rising temperatures and what we can do to defend ourselves against it. Last year, Portland, Oregon reached 116 degrees. It was the city's hottest temperature ever, part of a heat wave that impacted the Pacific Northwest and Western Canada. It lasted three weeks and more than 600 people died. Scientists say it was a one in a thousand year event, but experts warn that major heat waves are becoming much more common and predict that in the future, heat waves will last longer and be more extreme. Blistering temperatures are taking a deadly toll. Heat kills more people each year than hurricanes, tornadoes, and flooding combined. It's the number one weather-related killer in the United States. This is the uh, National Digital Forecast Database. We sometimes don't notice the effects of heat on our bodies until, until it's too late. And it's getting hotter here in South Florida too. Temperatures are higher, humidity more intense, but the biggest impact of our escalating temperatures happens at night. When the sun goes down, the temperatures stay up. The nighttime temperatures appear to be increasing faster than the daytime temperatures. At night, we're not cooling off as much as we used to. So you know, we're, not, we're not getting as much relief from those hot daytime temperatures. So we got the city of Miami here, we got Fort Lauderdale here, and then we pan up here, there we got Palm Beach County right here, we got Lake Okeechobee. Those warm nights and very hot days mean more work for forecasters at the National Weather Service in Miami. 63% and then right. less down here. Yeah. Meteorologists are issuing more heat advisories as the heat index, a combination of temperatures and humidity, rises to 105 degrees. Unfortunately, these critical warnings are often ignored by South Floridians because high heat it's a way of life around here. The storm is just crawling right now, five miles per hour. A hurricane warning, on the other hand, gets everyone's attention. Now, a group in Washington wants to create a heat wave ranking system, like the one used for hurricanes. So when you have a hurricane bearing down uh, in your neighborhood and you find out it's a category one, the way you, the way people would prepare for that, and the way the authorities would prepare for that, may look a lot different than if it's a Category Five uh, hurricane. Unlike the hurricane scale, this proposed system would categorize heat waves based on projected health outcomes. In most years, intense heat claims more lives than hurricanes, tornadoes, and floods combined. And I think a lot of people would be surprised to hear that. It just gives people, I think, a little bit better sense of. Hey, what, what, this could be dangerous for me. What can I do to protect myself and my family uh, in a way that we, we don't get with just a weather-based warning system? At the moment, the team is proposing three heat wave categories. When initiated, each would set off a series of protocols designed to protect the public. Meteorologist Sandra Shaw now with a deep dive into the program as we battle the heat. Sandra? Miami-Dade County is one of six locations where the program Mike talked about is being tested this summer. 
proving that South Florida is taking the global lead in targeting temperatures. It's hot as hell. It's hot as hell, just like being in hell. I wish I were not here in it, but I ain't got no other choice. We have over 300,000 outdoor workers here in Miami-Dade County, and they are up to 35 times more likely to have a heat-related illness. Jane Gilbert is Miami-Dade's chief heat officer. It's the first position in the world. Heat and concerns around displacement, climate gentrification, were the top two concerns in our more uh, lower income communities. This is an urban heat island, an area where there's more concrete and asphalt than there is tree canopy or greenery. And so the temperatures here in these areas are five to 10 degrees hotter than elsewhere. Like steamy hot, like, like uh, to the fact that when you come outdoors, you will not want to have on any clothes, that type of hot. Right across the street from Cherry Thompson's neighborhood, new trees are going up at Gwen Cherry Park on Northwest 22nd Avenue. We've had native species planted throughout this park as a result of a donation. It's part of our Million Trees Miami initiative. Gilbert coordinates projects on cooling, education, and infrastructure. We not only have the health impacts of extreme heat, but the costs. We have increasing utility costs and the majority of our population here is already cost burden when it comes to housing. For her three-year plan, she compiled a 15-member task force. It includes things like cooling resiliency centers equipped with water and chargers in case of a blackout. They also plan to train citizens to deliver first aid. We could see four to ten more degrees by the end of the century in 80 years. That combined with the urbanization, we're growing, continuing to grow rapidly could uh, result in well over three months of high danger heat indexes of 105 or more. Following Miami's lead, Phoenix, Arizona just appointed a chief heat officer and officials in Los Angeles have voted to assign someone into that role as well. Internationally, Sierra Leone as well as Athens, Greece now have chief heat officers. To understand what's happening, I'm at the Show Your Stripes exhibit, where you can walk through time and see how the Earth's annual average temperature has changed from 1850 to 2018. But there is a way to turn down the heat. And for more on that, meteorologist Vanessa Vanent has a new project that is really gaining roots. Trees play a huge role in our natural world, and with more people moving to South Florida every day, the green landscape is disappearing. But some people are determined to see green again along I-95 in Delray Beach. So this is where I grew up at. Sits the old neighborhood where Rose Newbold Biffo lived in the 50s. We had everything as far as the fruit trees, the vegetables, trees, all of that type stuff, especially in our backyard. They say the best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago. Next best time is today. The nonprofit organization Community Greening is planting more than seeds. Oh, there's a flower Ooh. completely out, like right there, that is. That is a future sugar apple right there. In 2017, the group got to work at Carver Park. Now the project is bearing fruit. It's feeding people in this neighborhood. Whenever there's ripe fruit, they can come out and pick from these fruit trees. It's good, especially if you get it right, real ripe, ripe right one. off the tree. Yes. Because I've had them you know, from a store and it didn't taste all that great, but then I had one right off the tree. Yeah. And it was delicious. It's delicious. I mean, if you're growing your own food locally, that's the goal here is really to get people to start growing their own food so that we're not decimating the environment and we're able to eat healthy, local, fresh food that's even better for you than anything that comes from the market. Throughout the years, hundreds of trees have spread throughout the community. This is a paradise tree. It's uh, been in the ground now for probably three years. So you can see three years of growth from a tree that was probably about this big is, you know, quite a bit of growth adding shade to this community. We if you walk down the street, planting. trees are now growing at a local school and on the grounds of a church where they feed people twice a week using what they grow. We planted live oaks along this trail. Farther north in All West Palm Beach at Dreyer Park. A lot of people love the live oak as far as it's extremely beneficial to wildlife. It's very storm resistant and it's gonna provide a lot of shade. The focus is on building tree canopies for shade and to reduce flooding. Trees slow that down. So they intercept a lot of that water that's coming down in rain events and it, you know, it gets caught in the leaves and it goes down and trickles down the trunk. And so there's less water that's actually building up that's going to flood your property or flood your neighborhood. And you can see how much shade they provide and how beautiful they are. The tree canopy coverage 
is the percentage of trees that are covering the land. In South Florida, we have these communities with really low tree canopies. Boynton Beach has 16% tree canopy. Delray has 23% tree canopy. In neighborhoods near highways, trees clean the polluted air. And you think of all those emissions from the cars that are going into the neighborhood. So the leaves are capturing those particles. For Rose, these trees are a big deal. This is our stomping ground. This is still home to us, even though our parents are gone. They are reminders of her history, her mom and dad, and a hope for the future. We appreciate it because even though it's not the original tree, it reminds us still of our father and how he took care of things and how they took care of us. Community Greening has planted more than 10,000 trees across South Florida. The organization says one of the contributing factors to fewer trees was citrus canker. In the early 2000s, thousands of fruit trees were cut down because of a massive outbreak. Next on Forecasting Our Future. Are these some of the corals that we're talking about here? There's more reef out there to treat. The fight to save the beating heart of the ocean. Plus, the crisis brewing underwater. There's been about a 60% decline in seagrass habitat. The emergency solutions to try and save Florida's iconic creatures. You're watching a WPBF 25 First Warning Weather Special, forecasting our future. Florida's coral reef stretches more than 350 miles from the dry Tortugas in the Keys all the way north to the St. Lucie Inlet. Millions of plants and animals rely on it. Meteorologist Glenn Glazer investigates the ongoing effort to save the largest coral reef in the United States. Glenn? Here at the Science Center, you can see three-dimensional coral reefs and take a journey through this amazing ecosystem. But out in the ocean, ecosystems like this are disappearing at an incredible rate. And the reason is not what you might think. My children are native-born Floridians. And from the first time their little feet touched the sand, that was a long crawl, the ocean began calling. But while life is thriving above the waves, below, it's dying. If I look down, you know, on a reef, kind of like I'm an airplane from an airplane, and I ask how much of that reef is coral, um, it's now below 5% at most locations. Are these some of the corals that we're talking about here? Sure, so um, you know, these are all skeletons of corals. Okay. Um, so corals are the really interesting organism where they have a, they build a calcium carbonate skeleton underneath this living veneer of tissue that's a combination of the coral animal and the algae that live inside it. This skeleton not only provides habitat for millions and millions of fishes, it also protects all of our homes here on the Treasure Coast. So when storms come, these corals dissipate that wave energy and help to protect our shorelines. Recently, something has changed, and it has Dr. Josh Voss and his team scrambling to take action. What is killing the coral out there. Why, why is this, why do you need to do this? So the biggest issue lately has been a new coral disease outbreak that we call stony coral tissue loss disease. Okay. What's different about this one is that it seems to infect a much broader range of coral species and it seems to just be relentless. John Hunt, a scientist for Florida Fish and Wildlife, along with Dr. Voss, is working to help save the reefs through outplanting. Is that like taking a potted plant and putting it out in the forest and putting it in the soil and hoping that it'll grow there, is that, is that kind of the same thing? So think of this as a tree nursery where you have, in this case, many hundreds of thousands of corals, and when they grow up enough in the nursery, then we remove them from the nursery and put them out on the reef. We believe that it's the, the largest coral outplanting experiment to date, um, and we're hoping to determine essentially whether or not this restoration can be successful in the face of the diseases that we're seeing out on the reef right now. How big is this entire coral piece? Probably the most groundbreaking experiment is an idea that came from one of Dr. Voss's students. One of my grad students, Erin Schilling. This is the outline of where we actually swam with the camera. Her main thesis project was to assess whether or not we could use amoxicillin or chlorinated epoxy to treat these corals. Yes, scientists and students are applying a human antibiotic, and it's working. We pat the syringes on deck and then apply it to the coral underwater. The, the challenge is that, like, by design, it's sticky. Oh. Right? We want it to stay attached 
to the colony. Dr. Voss and his team headed 70 miles west of Key West to the Dry Tortugas National Park, and there they got to work. Each of us was averaging about four dives a day. Um, and so we would treat, you know, o over that time period, we treated a, a total of just over 6,000 colonies. Um, but even that was only over, you know, roughly three kilometer stretch of reef. So um, it was a great success and accomplishment, but there's more reef out there to treat. To make sure the treatment continues working, scientists are using newly invented 3D imaging. So we were able to see over time by filming these models like once a month for almost a year um, that the individual corals kept a lot more healthy tissue when they were treated with this. Dr. Voss and his FAU Harbor Branch team, along with Florida Fish and Wildlife, will continue their research. But there are simple things we can do. We can all help by practicing the best possible environmental behavior that we can. We need to be mindful about water quality and, and support policies both at the local and state level that are uh, going to improve our local waterways so that corals will benefit from that as well. After all, by helping our coral reefs, we're not only helping those that live in the ocean, but also those who live on land. And that's a forecast for a better future for all of us. Meteorologist Brooke Silverang joins me now. And Brooke, if people watching want to get involved with restoring our coral reefs, scientists say ask local dive groups, ask local nonprofits what you can do to help. Because it's not just our coral reefs that are at stake, manatees are in danger as well. The population on Florida's east coast has dropped 20% since 2020. Unfortunately, back in 2015, Sketchy did die due to a boat strike. For manatees, boat propellers and cold Florida winters used to be their deadliest problems. This is a manatee's lower jawbone, and you can see by the teeth that they have, they only have molars. But now their main food source is dying off in the Indian River Lagoon. Right now, a UME, or Unusual Mortality Event, has been declared, and what that means is that there is currently a record-breaking number of manatee deaths going on. Conservationists along the East Coast are trying to keep up with the environmental emergency. According to the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission, in 2021, there was 1,101 manatee deaths. In 2020, there was less than 700. We are going to have a ramp here to help rescue and release baby manatees known as calves. At Manatee Lagoon in West Palm Beach, a ramp will be going in to help rescue and release six sea cows. And a transport truck will be on standby to move the massive gentle giants to marine sanctuaries to recover. Hey there, the manatee's coming this way. Its underlying cause is really too much pollution from human waste entering the, that system on the Indian River Lagoon which has caused a loss in seagrass. So Biologists with the nonprofit Save the Manatee Club say pollutants from fertilizers along with Florida's oppressive heat leads to harmful algae blooms. And that's not all. They also believe sea level rise could throw off the delicate balance of our waters, stopping seagrass from growing. We think manatees are really symbolic of the healthy aquatic ecosystem or an ailing one. We've noticed within the past 10 to 12 years, there's been about a 60% decline in seagrass habitat in the Indian River Lagoon. Inside of our tank, we have three of the most abundant species of seagrass you can find in the lagoon, being turtle grass, manatee grass, and shoal grass. Inside the nursery at Harbor Branch Oceanographic Institute in Fort Pierce, they're growing temporary solutions. We were talking about how you guys are making an effort to make this grass that you're growing inside. So how the manatees, have you seen them react to this grass? Yeah, so they haven't gotten to the point where they're actually going out and transplanting the seagrass yet. Um, okay. There have been supplemental feeding that's been going on with FWC where they've been putting out romaine lettuce for them. Um, and they have seen some success with that. Researchers at the Harbor Branch also believe when the water is polluted and cloudy, the sun can no longer feed the seagrass, which in turn puts a kink in the food chain of the ecosystem. Manatees are an indicator species, meaning that they're a great indication of if something is wrong in the environment. So the fact that we've lost a lot of manatees this past year, over a thousand, um, definitely is telling us something about the environment that they're living in. In 2017, manatees were downgraded from endangered to threatened under the Endangered Species Act. If you want to help save the manatees, you could do so by using eco-friendly fertilizers. Coming up on Forecasting Our Future. Overall, the long-term effect on the most vulnerable, the poorest people, is more than anybody should accept. The connection between extreme weather and your health. What's behind the rise in deaths?
So far in 2022, severe weather is exploding around the country. There have been more tornadoes in the month of March than any other in history. Meteorologist Chris Martinez explains how this extreme weather affects our daily lives. Chris? Mike, all those storms can take both a mental and physical toll on our health, which can lead to long lasting impacts down the road. Florida's beautiful landscape actually makes Kitty London miserable. There's something in the atmosphere and I know a lot of people who are suffering right now and we all say the same thing, like this is not normal anymore. The multimedia content creator struggles with life altering allergies. I think when you're hot, it just flares everything up. Um, for example, anything that's green, grass, trees. Um, I have allergies to dander. I have allergies to mold. Um, so when it's hot, that brings out a lot of things. And experts say weather is tied to more serious health problems. Dr. Robbie Parks, an environmental epidemiologist with Columbia University, was the lead author of a landmark study targeting climate and health. People are in a situation where high winds kick up uh, dust or uh, shake trees down and add to the, for example, to the pollen count and to the dust count in the air which may aggravate breathing. Research from the Journal of the American Medical Association shows hurricanes and tropical storms contribute to a 33% higher death rate. The study out of Columbia University ties the disasters to illnesses like respiratory and cardiovascular diseases to neuropsychiatric disorders. I've been involved since 2016. That's Dr. Cheryl Holder is the co-chair kind of, of the Florida Clinicians for Climate Action, a group of healthcare professionals. Our climate has changed enough, and with the extreme weather and these things being so much more intense, that's a level of stress you've never experienced it before. One of the FCCA's biggest fights is providing crucial support for people in underserved communities. Overall, the long-term effect on the most vulnerable, the poorest people, is more than anybody should accept. When you don't have resources and you have got to prepare for a storm, and you're living paycheck to paycheck. That's not happening. Holder says environmental concerns need to be front and center in community conversations in order to have a healthier, sustainable future. We're still hopeful that we can address these mental health issues, these physical issues. There are things we can do as a society to make the impact not be as detrimental and to save more people. Dr. Holder believes that early education is key. She encourages other healthcare providers to join her environmental health initiative so that together they may prevent you and your family from the long lasting impacts from extreme weather events. Our mission is to examine the increasing impact of weather on our communities. Throughout the year, we'll explore solutions to prevent future damage to the environment. This is just the first in a series of programs we call forecasting our future. Again, thank you for watching.